here. Let me share. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I, let me share the screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, you should be able to see the slides right now. Can you see also the mouse pointer moving? Could you confirm that you? Yes. Yes, yes we can see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. So um, today I'd like to speak about the EU AI Act and in particular trying to explain the rationale uh, behind uh, this pioneering uh, European regulation. Uh, but before doing so, I'd like to um, point out that uh, uh, Nobel Prizes have just been assigned uh, in the last days. Uh, and uh, as you probably know, the Nobel Prize in physics uh, uh, was assigned to John uh, Hopfield uh, and Jeffrey Hinton uh, for uh, their uh, um, outstanding contribution uh, to machine learning. And I could say that uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, uh, was assigned to the human genius uh, responsible for AI. And I would like also to point out that the day in which uh, this uh, Nobel Prize was assigned uh, uh, was the 8th of October, which is uh, Adam Lovelace Day. And this is a nice uh, coincidence because uh, Adam Lovelace uh, was uh, the, the factor first programmer in the world. Uh, and uh, what is very nice of her is the fact that she uh, was actually able to uh, write a program for a computer that never existed, that never was built. And in my opinion, uh, this is uh, even uh, a most important and more important contribution uh, to uh, computational thinking because it demonstrates that uh, having in mind the opportunity of uh, giving instruction to a programmable machine triggers our computational thinking skills uh, and makes us able to conceive algorithms and programs and eventually write programs that solve computational problems uh, once and for all. So that contribution is uh, particularly important. Uh, and even if uh, uh, no computers were built at the time, uh, she was a programmer and she uh, also uh, started uh, thinking uh, at the opportunity for machines to eventually think or eventually generate something uh, uh, by themselves. And then, Yesterday, actually the day before yesterday, uh, another Nobel Prize was assigned. And once again, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, came uh, to the Nobel Prize because I could say that in this case, the Nobel Prize was assigned to artificial intelligence in the sense that in this case, uh, uh, David Baker, Dennis Adams, and John Jumper um, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry because they successfully applied artificial intelligence uh, to solve the problems that were unsolved by means of traditional uh, algorithms. And in particular, protein folding and protein design are two very challenging problems that were successfully solved thanks to AI. Okay, this is uh, uh, the history of uh, AI. Uh, this is not mine, but I'd like to complement it by adding uh, other Lovelace uh, together with Charles Babbage uh, and uh, also to name uh, John McCarthy because uh, the uh, name artificial intelligence was uh, actually uh, introduced by John McCarthy in 1955. And I'd like also to point out that uh, this period uh, is called the night of artificial intelligence because uh, um, nobody uh, spoke about uh, artificial intelligence at that time, or almost nobody. And then from the 80s uh, to our days, uh, there have been a lot of progress. But I'd like also to uh, extend this line, this timeline, uh, uh, to point out that uh, OpenAI, generative uh, pre-trained transformer, 
came uh, to the place uh, and in uh, 2021 uh, we had uh, DAL-E and then ChatGPT in uh, 2022 and then uh, GPT-4 in 2023. And I'd like to say that uh, 2024 is the year of Nobel Prize uh, assigned to artificial intelligence, which is another milestone, I would say, in this uh, in this path. And this is a quote uh, by Adam Lovelace. So, so the analytical engine has no pretensions of whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform, but it has no power of anticipating any analytical relations or truth. And this is some kind of a, a very, I would say, uh, aware prediction of what computer uh, would eventually be able to do. Because it's still true, even if we are speaking about artificial intelligence. And uh, um, it is, in my opinion, uh, uh, very interesting that she, um, she felt the need for uh, answering this question before computers were built. And in fact, what Ada um, had in mind was what is called an ideal performer. An ideal performer is an agent that performs everything and only what it is told to do. And it is ideal in the sense that it has no intelligence, no fantasy, no creativity, no intuition, no free will or will, uh, no instinct. And it is free from uh, tiredness, distraction, uh, feelings, and mistakes, and so on. And this makes it an ideal performer, while uh, human beings are not ideal performer, because uh, they work in the, <laughs> in the opposite way. And the assumption here is that uh, we have the ability to express the task to be carried out in an unambiguous, exhaustive, understandable, and executable way. And this assumption is not trivial at all, uh, and it becomes, becomes uh, operative uh, if we uh, switch from uh, the abstract idea of an ideal performer to the idea of a programmable machine. So ideal performer as a programmable machine. Because in this case, what we call an ideal performer is a programmable machine or a human being that reads, interprets, and executes one by one the unambiguous elementary instructions taken from a pre-established set, which is what we call the instruction set, which make up a program. So this is an operative definition of what an ideal performer is. And only if we start from the ideal from the idea of having a programmable machine, we can uh, uh, come out with such an operative definition, which is not as abstract as the previous one. And then uh, I'd like to um, also quote um, Alan Turing, and uh, this is uh, taken from uh, his uh, article uh, in uh, Period in Mind uh, in 1950, so the original question, can machines think, uh, I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. Nevertheless, uh, I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machine thinking without expecting to be contradicted. So this is something which is uh, very interesting as well, because uh, in this um, groundbreaking article in which uh, um, Alan Turing uh, uh, spoke about computing machinery and intelligence, uh, and this is uh, the, um, the contribution where uh, the imitation game was introduced uh, as a test for uh, uh, assessing whether or not uh, a machine uh, was behaving like a human being, uh, Alan Turing uh, says that uh, uh, machines can never think. So to some extent, is, he is uh, uh, saying something which is very similar to what uh, Adam Lover has said uh, 100 years before. 
Okay, so what is artificial intelligence? So there are many forms of artificial intelligence and uh, we switch from uh, artif artificial narrow intelligence, which is uh, an artificial intelligence designed to perform a very specific task. And to some extent also the artificial intelligence applied to uh, protein design and protein folding is narrow, even if it solved a uh, problem of incredible complexity to uh, what is called uh, artificial general intelligence, uh, where uh, the um, artificial intelligence entities can behave in a human-like way across all the tasks. And what we are facing right now, which are uh, the, um, the large language models uh, that uh, um, make it possible to speak to an entity of uh, any topic uh, are uh, something that uh, uh, fits into the definition of artificial general intelligence. And then we um, could have at some point uh, what is called the artificial super intelligence, uh, where artificial intelligence uh, entity uh, could uh, um, eventually become smarter than humans. This is not something that is related only to science fiction, but it's uh, also something that uh, is uh, reasonably expected to happen just because uh, the uh, technology is evolving uh, very fast uh, while our brain is not. So since we are already in uh, uh, a world where there are uh, computing machinery that uh, uh, implement machine learning models uh, that uh, are general enough to be able to uh, speak of any topic, uh, we can expect a critical mass to be reached where at some point uh, the general intelligence of a machine will uh, um, overcome that uh, of human beings. Now, um, I'd like to um, do something very uh, elementary, I would say, or trivial, maybe, uh, to point out what artificial intelligence is uh, and uh, where we sometimes uh, uh, believe that uh, intelligence is uh, while it is not. So let me take uh, Robbie, this kind of robot uh, that we look from, uh, from above, uh, as an ADR performer. And uh, let me also take a very trivial instruction set made uh, of these three uh, cards that represents uh, instructions that allow to move the robot uh, on uh, a board, on a, on a chessboard. So turn left, uh, move forward, and turn right where the effect of this instruction is that this one for turn left, this one for move forward, and this one for turn right. Okay, now, um, if we look inside any um, programmable device, any programmable machine, we uh, have to distinguish hardware and software. And the, um, what other Lovelace and Charles Babbage uh, did uh, um, 200 years ago was to establish this dichotomy because Babbage conceived the analytical engine and other, other uh, was able to program it. So uh, hardware and software uh, coming to place uh, uh, whenever there is the idea of any machine uh, built, uh, designed uh, in order to execute instructions rather than directly designed to solve a problem or to accomplish a task. Excuse now, me, what happens uh, is... Alessandro, if, yes. uh, we have a question. Could we interrupt you to, to, to sure, make it? Absolutely. Uh, please, Sanson. Okay. Uh, he's, he's, uh, in Sion was asking... What uh, stage of NI, NAI, AGI, or SAI we are currently? Uh, I think that right now we are uh, in, um, 
in, in a time of where we are still using the narrow artificial intelligence, but we do have uh, also general artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence uh, in place. Uh, and in particular, large language models uh, are for sure examples of uh, um, artificial general intelligence agents because we can uh, you know, use them for any purpose and they have been trained on all our knowledge because um, the well i i'll go through it uh, in a moment but basically the amount of data uh, that have been used to train them uh, is uh, not targeted to a specific uh, topic or to a specific task but rather it uh, is uh, as broad as possible in order to make uh, the same entity able to speak of everything uh, and even to pass tests in uh, any kind uh, of topic. Uh, so this is uh, an, a, a true example uh, of artificial general intelligence. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so what I'd like to point out is that if we put the robot uh, uh, and we ask the robot to face any task. So for instance, following this uh, very simple task uh, made of the axis of the chessboard, uh, without the program, it does nothing. With a single instruction, uh, it executes the instruction and then it stops. And then we can provide another instruction, another instruction, another instruction, and drive uh, it uh, to the target. But in this case, uh, we don't perceive any intelligent behavior because we are just driving the robot the instruction by instruction. Uh, something changes uh, if we uh, provide the entire program. And in this case, uh, if we um, have the entire program written in advance uh, and we provide instruction by instruction or we uh, assume that the, or we allow the robot to read an instruction at a time by itself, then some kind of apparent intelligence can uh, can appear just because it performs the task uh, thanks to the suitable program autonomously or apparently in an autonomous way because the program is in memory. And that's uh, the reason why I point out that hardware and software are now inside the robot. Uh, and this entails that uh, uh, the microprocessor is not the only component, but we also need a memory as a key component to make the behavior uh, looking, uh, if uh, not intelligent, at least a switchboard to solve the task. And now, uh, Robbie, with the program in memory, does perform the task by itself. And this is something that could appear as intelligent uh, if uh, we don't know that uh, a human being uh, has written the program and provided the program and uploaded the program into the uh, memory of the robot. Notice that I'm, uh, I, I hope you um, forgive me for uh, um, making examples are so trivial, but I'd like to make a trivial examples that can be extended to uh, the computers performing any kind of tasks. But in this case, uh, I could uh, uh, use uh, a through programming language uh, and very complex examples, but uh, the uh, idea that I would like to communicate would be exactly the same. Um, now, what happens if uh, we uh, have uh, Robbie facing a different task, but with the same program in memory? This is what happens, that uh, Robbie does exactly the same, and uh, this means that uh, the behavior, uh, which is exactly the behavior that it had before, is uh, not uh, uh, looking intelligent anymore, just because it is not... Uh, suitable to solve the new task. So what we need is a context awareness and adaptation. And to this purpose, we need sensors, but sensors by themselves are not enough. We also need uh, um, to switch from linear code, which is just uh, a sequence uh, of elementary instructions, uh, 
two programming constructs. And in this case, I'm using, uh, without introducing them, so forgive me again, I'm using these uh, cards to represent uh, uh, a repetition, um, a repetition constructs in this case, and this means uh, repeat until you reach the yellow target, and what you have to repeat is uh, move forward. So the behavior is, uh, um, am I on uh, a young target? No. Then I execute, move forward. Am I on a young target? No. So I execute, move forward, and so on, until I reach the yellow target, and then I stop. So if the robot behaves like this, then the robot is able to adapt its behavior to the length of the path, because uh, until uh, he reaches the target, uh, it doesn't stop. Okay, now I can make it uh, even uh, better because in this case, uh, I can tell the robot uh, uh, repeat until you reach the yellow target. If there is path ahead, which means uh, if uh, uh, you find uh, an X in the, in the tile in front of you, then move forward. And this allows the robot not to, to uh, fall upside the path. But on the other hand, this is not suitable to reach the target because there is no instruction telling the robot to eventually turn left. But if I uh, add something which is else uh, construct, which is uh, represented by this uh, reverse uh, question mark, then the robot uh, can perform the task because I say until you reach the yellow target, if there is a path forward, move forward, otherwise, or else, turn left. And in this case, when the robot uh, reaches the end of this, uh, um, or this uh, first part of the path and there is no uh, path forward, then it executes the help, the else um, option, which means a turn left, and then going back, it uh, starts now re-executing and following the other uh, leg because uh, it executes uh, the move forward because uh, after having turned left, uh, it has moved forward. And I keep complicating the code and that the constructs uh, without uh, pretending to explain it, but I think that you can roughly uh, imagine that uh, this uh, will provide more degrees of freedom uh, and more consciousness uh, to the robot uh, of the context uh, and, the, and the path. And this is something that looks uh, quite general and uh, in fact, it allows the robot to reach the target in this path, but also to follow a path like this. And a path like this. But if I, um, if I try to understand whether this code is general enough or it is uh, uh, possibly universal, I can easily find a, a counterexample like this in which the target is never reached. And by executing this code, the robot will keep moving uh, back and forward, back and forward, back and forward along the main path without never trying to explore the, the right branch. Okay, so in this case, it fails. What we need to add to the capabilities of our robot? So what we need to add is non-determinate. And non-determinism is something that uh, can uh, be perceived uh, from the outside uh, as some form of free will, because uh, so far we could be surprised by the skills or by the capabilities of the robot uh, if we were not the programmer. But if we add uh, some non-determinism, then uh, the behavior of the robot uh, can surprise also the programmer because the programmer cannot uh, exactly predict where the robot will stop and uh, when the robot will eventually reach the target. But if we just uh, uh, ask the robot, uh, this is a jolly instruction. So 
And so when uh, the robot has to execute this instruction, it, it can uh, freely decide uh, in a pseudo-random way whether to move forward, turn left, or turn right. But if we just uh, um, let the robot uh, uh, execute this code, at some point uh, it will probably uh, fall outside the chessboard. And this is something that corresponds to a fail. But if we uh, add some control, and uh, for instance, uh, if we, um, so this is just a, a, an explanation of what uh, uh, in practice having this kind of uh, jolly means, because I can say that uh, when there is uh, this, uh, this car, uh, the um, robot of the computer, um, uh, for instance, uh, takes uh, a yellow, green, uh, or red card or uh, ballet uh, from, uh, from a box. And depending on the color, then it executes uh, one of the three instructions. But again, this fails because there are no control, no awareness of the size of the, of the chessboard. But then we can uh, do the same by tossing a coin and saying that uh, uh, if the coin uh, is a head, then something happens. If it is uh, not, then something else, uh, and so on. But what we have to do at some point is to add not only pseudo-random numbers, uh, generators that uh, introduce this kind of free will, but also sensors. But then there is something more. So moving uh, away from uh, these uh, simple examples uh, that can be made by a simple robot uh, on a chessboard, uh, let's add speed, so execution speed. And what we can add, thanks to execution speed, uh, is brute force. So as you know, there are, uh, uh, as you probably know, there are uh, algorithms that are called the brute force. Uh, when uh, they are based uh, on an exhaustive search uh, on the, the search space, on the space of possible solutions. So when we have no idea how to solve uh, in a very efficient way a problem, we can uh, search, explore the entire search space, uh, space uh, in an exhaustive way, and this is called brute force. So, for instance, uh, finding an Eulerian path, uh, which means uh, finding a path that uh, um, travel across all edges in this graph uh, just once uh, is a non-trivial problem. Actually, it is not only non-trivial, but it's uh, a very complex problem for which uh, no polynomial solutions exist. So this means that uh, in order to find this kind of path, and the other uh, very similar problem is called uh, uh, finding an Hamiltonian path, which means uh, going uh, through all uh, the uh, vertices of this graph, uh, uh, visiting them only once. Uh, this is a, a very similar problem, uh, and it is uh, as complex as the finding a Eulerian path. And what we can do to try to solve it for sure is to, is to explore the entire decision tree, starting from a vertex uh, and trying to find the path and moving uh, and then uh, going back whenever we find uh, that uh, no path were found on that way and so on. And uh, what can be done in this case, uh, if uh, we know that there are very complex problems, so we can uh, let a robot, uh, a computer, explore the entire space. And since this kind of exploration can take advantage of the incredible speed of today's technology, the computer can eventually, uh, sometimes even in a very short time, come out with a solution or even with the best solution. And in this case, we can uh, uh, see that a computer finds the solutions that we are not able to find. And in this case, once again, we can consider it as intelligent, even if it is not. Because uh, in this case, it is only using what is uh, uh, almost the opposite of intelligence, which is brute force, which is the brute force uh, provided by its speed. 
So making exhaustive search uh, is uh, nothing but uh, is not intelligent at all because it means that I look to all the solution and choose the best one only once I found it. I have no idea on how to directly go to that specific solution. Alessandro, uh, yes. uh, I'm sorry, but when I see this graph, because I can't avoid thinking about my vacuum cleaner robot. <laughs> it's yeah. the best robot I have, <laughs> the only one. So it's, it's, it would be an example of... You yeah, it is. A, um, yeah. If I, um, so your robot incorporates artificial intelligence for sure. Uh, it's a narrow form of artificial intelligence, which is the one which uh, uh, allows the robot to uh, effectively explore and cover all the floor of your room, of your house, uh, trying to understand where the walls uh, are and uh, what's the shape. But um, for this kind of uh, problems, uh, there were also traditional algorithms uh, that were quite uh, effective. And for instance, uh, your robot could also resemble so the um, resemble the robot that I that I showed before. Uh, this one that uh, moved around to search for the for the target uh, just. Uh, tossing a coin uh, at every step uh, in order to decide where to go. In your case, uh, your robot uh, uh, toss a coin uh, or just uh, take uh, a, a decision which uh, looks uh, autonomous uh, or pseudo-random whenever it, uh, um, it goes too uh, close to any kind of obstacle. And in order to avoid obstacles, at some point, uh, uh, pseudo-random decisions are the best ones. So there are also traditional algorithms uh, without artificial intelligence that allow these kind of robots uh, to do so. And uh, by the way, um, well, I, I don't want to go uh, to go back to to previous slides, but. In the history of artificial intelligence, your robot is there, <laughs> so and uh, and it dates back uh, in the in the 20th century, not yours in particular, but this kind of technology. <laughs> so it's uh, it's very <laughs> it's very old and quite traditional and very very narrow as a form of intelligence. But now uh, I'd like to point out that uh, the contributions of John Hopefield uh, and Jeffrey Hinton. Uh, um, really made a difference uh, because of the rise of machine learning. So the true uh, form of uh, artificial intelligence uh, that we are still uh, using right now is rooted in neural networks. Uh, and neural networks and machine learning uh, uh, made by means of neural networks uh, um, is uh, also due to the fundamental contributions of John Offield and Jeffrey Hinton. And neural networks are basically right now simulated by traditional computers that run software. So once again, neural networks are made of software, but the models are huge and the weights uh, of the connections between uh, neurons uh, called the synapses are uh, regulated in such a way that they can be adjusted during a training phase so that the knowledge that neural networks can incorporate thanks to the examples that we provide in the training phase are incorporated into the small numbers, a huge amount of numbers that, represents, that represent all the weights to be assigned to these edges. So basically the knowledge is nothing but a matrix of numbers. So after the training of a neural network, so we have a matrix that contains uh, all the numbers to be assigned to all the connections between neurons. But the problem is that uh, these numbers are uh, billions of numbers, billions of numbers that have been adjusted uh, thanks to billions of examples. So the training phase is uh, huge, the model is uh, huge, 
And the time required to train the model uh, is uh, an incredible uh, amount of time, or if you prefer, it's uh, an incredible amount of computational power that is needed uh, to train a model. And large language models have been trained on huge amounts of data. And neural networks uh, are still behind these kind of technologies, um, even if uh, we have moved from neural networks to deep learning, uh, and then from deep learning to large language models. And um, what I'd like to point out is that when dealing with neural network, usually we distinguish a training phase and an inference phase. In the training phase, uh, the intelligence, uh, so the um, machine learning capabilities in place, once the model has been uh, trained uh, and it becomes uh, sufficiently uh, fit to the problem, then the network can stop, change, the matrix of numbers can be taken as is and can be just applied. So neural network becomes an algorithm that takes inputs and provides outputs as any other kind of algorithm, but with a big difference that right now there is no human being knowing exactly how the algorithm behaves because of the way and the reason why these numbers have been set in this way is not human understandable and there are no human beings uh, having the capability of looking inside uh, these models because they are too huge and uh, no human beings have the capability of understanding uh, the relationship between between a specific uh, number in this matrix and the effect uh, it produces and then where do um, large language models uh, and uh, uh, generative AI uh, appear in this, uh, in this figure? They are basically uh, in this corner, meaning that uh, uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Deep learning uh, is uh, a smaller subset uh, and large language model than generative AI are once again uh, a subset uh, of all these uh, subsets. But for sure right now, they are the most uh, impressive uh, and promising technologies that we have in hand. And they represent uh, what uh, I say to be the artificial general intelligence. Okay which are the known issues. So explainability, transparency. Transparency is not only uh, for the algorithm and the behavior, but also transparency is, transparency is very important uh, when uh, we deal with people, uh, users, uh, and who could uh, interact uh, un um, without being aware of it, uh, to artificial, with um, artificial intelligence agents. So what I mean is that uh, when, for instance, uh, you use a chatbot, uh, um, transparency means uh, that you need to know whether or not you are speaking uh, with a human being uh, or with an artificial intelligence entity. Then there are bias. Uh, this is a big problem because when we provide examples uh, to train uh, um, machine, a machine learning model, we may end up uh, having provided uh, uh, examples uh, that are uh, inherently biased because uh, they are not complete, they are not representative uh, of the whole uh, situations uh, where the model will then be used. And in this case, we create biases that can impact on the actual decisions that the, the model will then take during the inference. Then there are hallucinations. That means that uh, um, machine learning can make uh, errors. Errors are sometimes due to the fact that the way in which these matrix of numbers represents the knowledge and the experience uh, that they have uh, they, they have been exposed to can uh, fail in representing true experiences and true memories and sometimes can uh, uh, represent artifacts and, and numerical errors and any uh, kind of uh, um, mishap of all 
the uh, information that they'll be using for training. And this may end up uh, um, giving rise to true hallucinations. So uh, effects uh, and uh, results, unexpected results of uh, uh, machine learning models uh, that provide outputs uh, that do not correspond to anything real and fall quite far from uh, the training sets that were used for training. And then there is a lack of control, which is another problem, because we cannot uh, have a guarantee that uh, the behavior of an artificial intelligence entity uh, stays within the boundaries that, that we would like uh, to apply to a specific domain. And this is something related to the unexplainability, the lack of transparency, the lack of control on the training process and the results of the training process. And then there are ethical issues, a lot of ethical issues. Uh, whenever uh, so, um, We have to consider that artificial intelligence is mainly used to uh, classify, to predict, and to transform or generate. So all these uh, actions uh, can impact uh, um, humans, human beings, because the classification could be applied also to discriminate between uh, human being, among human beings, among those who can access gain access to a service and those uh, human beings uh, who have no access to, uh, to the same service, just to say something which is not uh, apparently uh, a big concern, but indeed it is, because it means a discrimination. And then there is dependability, because uh, usually a system, uh, in particular safety critical systems, uh, uh, are tested. And testing uh, is a process uh, that uh, cannot be exhausted because it is impossible to test uh, the actual behavior of the system against all, all possible situations. But when we have full control on the way in which uh, the system uh, uh, has been uh, designed and built, then we can uh, uh, design the tests in such a way uh, that uh, all the possible failures uh, cover it. But if we just uh, train a machine learning model, uh, there are no ways uh, of conceiving exhaustive tests that um, uh, allow us to make sure that the behavior uh, will uh, uh, be safe uh, in all possible situations. Um, there is also another uh, known issues that is not listed here, which is uh, the misalignment uh, or the need for alignment. So what I mean is that uh, this is particularly true for large language models. If we, for instance, train a large language models like uh, GPT-4 uh, with all the uh, public production, uh, um, written public production of humanity, this means that uh, there are a lot of misconceptions, uh, a lot uh, of biases, uh, a lot of cultural biases, uh, a lot uh, of uh, um, cultural gaps that can be also acquired by the uh, machine learning model. And uh, there are also uh, capabilities uh, that the machine learning model uh, has learned that cannot be exploited in our society because of societal rules, of societal limitations. So, for instance, if I ask a, a machine learning model how to build a bomb, this is something that I shouldn't be able to ask, or the machine learning model shouldn't be allowed to provide an answer. So this is called alignment. But then there is another problem because uh, alignment is uh, a process uh, which is uh, empirical. And uh, on the other hand, 
um, artificial intelligence models are so intelligent that can they can self-assign themselves uh, intermediate tasks. This means that if I ask uh, something which is legal to a um, machine learning model, I have also to make sure that in order to accomplish the task that I uh, assigned to it, uh, the machine learning model doesn't do something uh, illegal just to come to the conclusion. Uh, there is an example of a um, machine learning model that uh, was asked uh, to solve the CAPTCHA. And uh, CAPTCHAs are usually used in order to distinguish between a human beings and machines. And so the CAPTCHA uh, was uh, not, uh, sorry, the machine learning model was not able to solve the CAPTCHA. And instead of just uh, giving up, uh, it uh, uh, started interacting uh, with the support service uh, that was a chatbot in itself. And the chatbot asked the machine learning model, uh, are you a robot? Uh, are you an artificial intelligence? And the artificial intelligence said, no, I'm not. I'm just blind, so that I cannot see the caption and I cannot solve it. And so the chatbot provided the solution and the machine learning model uh, inputted the solution, so solved the capture and went through. And this is just an example of an intermediate task uh, that uh, was uh, outside the boundary of what uh, is, uh, I wouldn't say legal, but at least uh, uh, reasonable for a machine learning model to do. Okay, so. Having said all of that, <laughs> I come to the point uh, that is uh, it won't be long, uh, don't be afraid, but I, 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 I think that it was useful to uh, introduce it uh, to uh, understand why it is uh, so important to have a artificial intelligence act. And uh, first of all, the approach is a risk-based approach. So this means that in Europe, there are no forbidden technologies, no forbidden research on AI. So any kind of research can be done, any kind of technology can be used, but the regulation applies to products and services based on AI. So, the risk is not assigned to a technology, but uh, rather it is assigned to the use of a technology. And this makes a big difference. The other um, pragmatic uh, uh, decisions that the European Commission took was to um, deal with artificial intelligence uh, uh, as with any kind of feature of products. So the main idea was to try to protect end users, end users of services and users of products. And since in Europe, we already have a lot of regulations for the safety uh, of products circulating across Europe, and those are marked with a mark CE if they pass the full control and they are fully compliant with European regulations, instead of having something different, they took this kind of regulation and they incorporated the uh, AI Act into the CE mark. So this means that when, as a European user, I um, see a product, or a service, and I see the CE mark in the product, I don't need to be aware of the fact that that product incorporates artificial intelligence or make use, makes use of artificial intelligence, because if the CE mark is in place, this means that compliance is guaranteed not only for any other feature of that product, but also for the compliance to the uh, of the artificial intelligence embodiment uh, to the AI Act, and the AI Act uh, uh, is like uh, a pyramid where uh, the uh, larger part 
is made on uh, minimal risk uh, um, situations uh, that um, I would say do not require any form of regulation. And this is another uh, very pragmatic uh, decision. So, so the decision of explicitly uh, pointing out uh, those kind of applications that do not require specific attention because they do not entail uh, any risk, almost any risk. And then there are limited risks where transparency is uh, the uh, the solution is uh, what has to be enforced. So, for instance, uh, when uh, uh, we deal with chatbots, uh, when we risk uh, to uh, have deep fakes, uh, we need these chatbots and deep fakes uh, to be uh, watermarked uh, and to be declared uh, as uh, produced by artificial intelligence. And then we go up and up and we have uh, higher risks uh, uh, where uh, uh, artificial intelligence is used, not is in education. Uh, I'd like to point out this because uh, artificial intelligence used in education, but also in employment, justice, immigration, law. You see, education is at the same level. So this is high risk. And I, um, I agree with that because artificial intelligence in education, which is something which in my opinion is uh, prematurely uh, pushed by governments, uh, is something that has to be taken very, very carefully because uh, artificial intelligence is the most advanced form of uh, uh, computer science. And we are still uh, still the of literacy. We are still dealing with uh, situations, even in Italy, where there are schools where computer science is not taught at all. And it is uh, uh, definitely premature to um, state uh, that artificial intelligence can be taught at school without uh, teaching uh, uh, computer science without providing the fundamental uh, uh, instruments uh, to fully understand and to become fully aware of what you are dealing with. And then there are unacceptable risks. And what is uh, incredibly uh, <laughs> important here is that uh, applications that entail unacceptable risk are prohibited. So this means that there are no other rights. Those kind of applications cannot be admitted. And in particular, social scoring, for instance, is not admitted at all, or facial recognition in real time. So it is impossible in Europe, uh, according to this kind of regulation, to apply facial recognition in real time to possibly uh, track people uh, in real time or to um, do any kind of um, of social ranking uh, or uh, any kind of, um, I would say also uh, real-time sentiment analysis based on uh, face expression and so on. If this is not uh, uh, due to uh, law enforcement or something like that. Okay, so soon I'd like to uh, show you uh, a very nice, uh, uh, a very nice instrument navigated by yourself the AI Act, which is called uh, AI Act Explorer. So uh, let me just uh, uh, open it up because, in my opinion, it is very uh, intuitive and effective. Because you see. Here you have the, um, the contents divided in chapters, which um, are coherent to the representations that I gave, because the here you see general provisions and then prohibited AI practices, high risk, transparency obligations, general purpose AI models, measures in support of innovation, governance, and so on. And if we take, for instance, uh, prohibited AI practices, then here we find the uh, complete text of the article. But before going through the article, we find also a summary. And the summary is uh, uh, very strong 
and uh, readable so that uh, if we read the summary, which says in this case, for instance, the EU AI Act prohibits certain uses of artificial intelligence. These include AI systems that manipulate people's decisions or exploit their vulnerabilities, the systems that evaluate or classify people based on their social behavior, and so on. So uh, look at how many levels uh, do we have to explore this. We have this, which is the summary, then we have the full text, but for, uh, for each comma, then we have a recitor. And the recitor is something that expands with examples uh, what the article means. And if we go here, you see, you find a lot of text which is even more readable uh, and that provides a lot of examples. So those are all the recitals that you can find here to um, provide another way of uh, understanding uh, what uh, this article means. So I think that this is a very, very effective instrument. Uh, and I think that it is quite useless that I comment uh, it further because uh, then I, I leave it to your uh, personal exploration. Um, sorry for my ignorance in this subject, but I think it's crazy because uh, as far as I know, AI can be used, applied everywhere, in anything. So how to uh, reg make a regulation on everything? They have to predict everything. It's crazy. They don't. Uh, actually, uh, the idea of regulation is that they don't have to predict everything, but just uh, uh, big categories of application domains. Uh, and then this means that uh, uh, companies uh, uh, who want to provide the services uh, or to um, sell products that fall into this category have to uh, make sure that their services and products are compliant uh, with this. So it is not the uh, European Commission that goes uh, and uh, makes a classification of all possible products and services. But uh, having uh, this uh, uh, provision, it's uh, up to the um, companies uh, who want Enterprise. to provide the services of goods to make sure that, uh, uh, to verify which is the category in which they fall and to make sure that uh, they are compliant. And only if this compliance is then guaranteed and verified, they can uh, sell their products uh, within the European Commission having uh, the CE mark. But this also happens uh, to all kinds of products that circulate in Europe. And there is also an effect that is called the Brussels effect because uh, uh, Europe is a big market. Uh, it's not as big as China, for instance, or uh, India, but uh, it's uh, for sure a very interesting market. So it is uh, very difficult for uh, someone not to also target Europe uh, as a market. And this means that even companies that are outside Europe uh, can benefit uh, from adopting this kind of regulation as they already did for the CE mark. So even if outside the Europe, the CE mark is not needed, even non-European uh, customers um, are usually happy to know that uh, that products uh, are, can also circulate uh, in Europe because they know that they are also compliant with a specific regulation uh, that protects uh, users. And uh, the other reason why uh, this effect propagates, so to some extent, what I, uh, the Brussels effects says that uh, um, some of uh, European regulations propagate outside the Europe, uh, even where they are not enforced, just because of the reason, uh, because they can be seen as a competitive advantage by companies rather than being a limitation. Because uh, I have not mentioned that, but having a regulation, so um, 
we all know that uh, artificial intelligence is a so powerful uh, instrument uh, that uh, there is uh, uh, hope and fear. Uh, and these two different uh, feelings uh, um, are inside each of us, I would say, that nobody has uh, only hope uh, or only fear, but we have some kind of trade-off. And uh, having a regulation uh, uh, could uh, facilitate uh, adoption of a technology. Because if, if you know that there is a, a very powerful technology and this technology is not regulated, so any fear about uh, the, um, you know, the possible uh, misuses of this technology can prevent for adoption. While if there is a regulation that is a risk-based regulation, then this kind of regulation is conceived not to limit, uh, but to um, facilitate adoption and diffusion of the technology. I know that this is, uh, to some extent, could uh, be counterintuitive, uh, but I, I'm uh, uh, yes, I, I think it, it's it, it's interesting. It's good to know that someone who knows about it more than us uh, is exactly. taking care of it. Exactly. <laughs> yes, uh, yes I, I see. Thanks. Okay, that's exactly the idea. So, so thank you very much, Alessandro. So clear explanation from the beginning. And to the uh, really thank you. It's also a, a problem about the, the energetic consume, about uh, and also school. I, I see they are not. They doesn't care about the. They don't. Yeah. They don't care about that. Uh, they use uh, AI just to have fun, but should be maybe considered something different. The um, there is anything, yeah. There is anything about that in the regulation that you know? No, 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 because um, this is not it's about as, as far as I know. I, I, I couldn't uh, yeah. tell it for sure, but I, I don't think there is uh, something about, uh, um, I would cool. say, sustainability uh, of uh, environmental yeah. impact uh, of AI. Even if uh, this is a, another uh, very important uh, aspect. Issue. Um, I think that uh, within this group, it would be very, very interesting to have uh, another meeting, uh, which is not a presentation, but it just a brainstorming about uh, AI in the school. Because, in my opinion, this is uh, a topic uh, that is not properly addressed. Mm. And there are many uh, different aspects that are completely neglected when speaking about uh, AI at school. If I yes, look yeah. at the Italian situation where um, uh, most of the fundings of Next Generation EU uh, mm -hmm. are used to uh, train uh, teachers or to train uh, pupils, uh, uh, with new technologies, uh, so there are a, an incredible amount uh, of courses uh, about uh, uh, or training for teachers uh, about AI, which are usually taught by people uh, that uh, knows nothing about it. So they are just uh, teaching uh, how or training uh, teachers on how yeah. to use a tool. But this is not something that is uh, beneficial Indeed. because. Uh, uh, on the other hand, the teachers uh, um, fear that uh, uh, their pupils uh, become smarter than themselves uh, in uh, making use of these uh, technologies. So they can uh, be used for cheating uh, or for uh, passing exams or whatever. But this is not a big deal. So this is not uh, something that make it worth uh, introducing AI without... Uh, any any awareness and any any plan any roadmap in mind so uh, yeah. Yeah, i would really like to know your opinion on that yeah. uh, I, I have no solution unfortunately because uh, it, it cannot be prohibited but uh, i i don't think that it has to be pushed let's say at least yeah 
Uh, the same, I, I would add, uh, the same is for a, a VR, XR. I mean, yeah. yeah. And they don't care about our avatar. Uh, it's a problem for children and they don't take uh, yeah. attention, pick kids. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a, another issue. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. You are? And you, you told me you are yeah, participating in a group about just about AI. Just uh, thinking just thinking about the the impact the, that the AI uh, because always, always we, we are learning about the, the artificial the AI and the AI learning about us like human the interaction human computer but i thinking um every day the the, the interaction of human computer we are learning but the the interaction human to human is lost it is is very important when i thinking about that uh, today i i see a post on linkedin about the the elon musk the tesla uh, building robots like the 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 movie the fiction movie I Robot, I think wow, it's it's wonderful. But is I we are thinking about that. People people just thinking about machine machine machine, but the interaction human to human, where are where are? It's very important yeah. too. Yeah, uh, I fully agree. The, the problem is that since we don't need any technology to interact with each other, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> we should invent something to interact face to face uh, in order to <laughs> <laughs> to be appealing for big companies that will also build this tool. Yeah. The, the, the human is like a ghost. Like it was just in, in, in a home, interacted between uh through through the the the, the computer, uh just that. It's, 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 the, the future, the future is is amazing, but something I thinking about. <laughs> You know, it would be nicer to have uh, some kind of technology that uh, works uh, only if uh, two different people touch the two hands uh, of something. <laughs> and and you see, you are working on yeah. inventing something. <laughs> <laughs> you you can you can then you can share your your presentation. Is it is is good the the data, the data your your show? Absolutely. I I, I, super read interesting. I, I, yeah. I fix uh, some of the typos that I saw when uh, scrolling it and presenting it, and then I'll uh, send uh, I share it in the group. Thank you. And also the 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 video the recordings will be available if you want to share. Okay. Very 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 interesting presentation. I I learned a lot. Deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, okay. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure, and thank you for. It's a big uh, pleasure. Yeah. These are two different times. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank you so much. Your yeah. time thank you. And thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Louisa, as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good ciao, night. Ciao, ciao, Alessandro. <laughs>